Um, in the book, you talk about the fact that Matthew Charles Lamb's killing spree shocked the nation, that there was all this media coverage. Your bibliography clearly shows how much press coverage there was back in 1966. Yet today, his name and his crimes have fallen into relative obscurity, were it not for your book. I pulled some friends that are also East Windsorites. They didn't know about this. Why do you suppose that the story of Lamb has not been better known, even in Windsor, Ontario, where the murders happened? It, it, you know, I've asked myself that question many times because it, it, re it did receive a, a wide degree of coverage, and it wasn't just like through Windsor, the Windsor media, it was um, the American media, like the regional, uh, like Detroit covered it, they covered the, the murders, they covered the trial, Toronto covered the Globe and Mail, the Toronto, Toronto Star, but you're right, I mean, there's a lot of people that just have forgotten, um, and I guess, again, it wasn't, the story wasn't resuscitated until 10 years later, uh, with Matthew Charles Lamb's death in, in, in Rhodesia by military friendly fire um, that brought the story up again. I mean, it even went to the Canadian Parliament as to how, the, I mean, a lot of questions were asked as how was a, a man just recently released as a you know, criminally insane mass murderer, how was he able to get his passport twice he was to get it renewed while he's still an inmate at Oak Ridge, which at that point was the most dangerous facility where it held the most dangerous people in the country. But it was the primary sources that I, I did a lot of personal interviews. And because of my police background, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of in with the local police and a lot of the inspectors and detectives that have originally worked the case I'm writing about, the Matthew Lamb Canada's first street killing case. So I was very fortunate. So they, you know, they took me in there. And so I had easy access to a lot of, a lot of important people who really had some uh, insight on the case that was never released to the newspapers. You had a personal connection to one of his victims. Can you tell us about that connection and your inspiration for writing the book? Yeah, I was 12 years old and next door to me, a family moved in um, and the 19 year old daughter was Edith Tchaikovsky and I was 12 and I had this mad crush on her. And uh, I made friends with her little brother who was very nice, but it wasn't really him I was really interested in. I was really just trying to get her to to notice me <laughs> so uh, i so i really had this crush on this on this 20 year old woman and they moved away and then about three months after they moved away from my neighborhood uh, she was the first one to be shot from the death at the hands of matthew charles Lamb. what was the process of writing the book like for you the story had always stuck with me because i, I it really it was, it was traumatizing for me i was 12 years old and i think that death I had seen, you know, when you're 12 years old, you, you, you understand death and then the finality of it, uh, but it's usually in your grandparents and older people and, you know, and you come to accept that. But when you see a young teenage person, especially someone, someone that you had a crush on, um, it, it's, a, it's a real eye opener. You realize the world isn't the world you thought it was. And as I mentioned in, I think, in the preface to the book, um, I really believe it was her death and, of course, the, the death of the other death as well, but primarily her death that led me to, to become a police officer and an p officer in the first place. I never would have considered it, but I realized that the world wasn't the same place I once thought it was. He was, an, he was an omen of things to come because that was a very strange summer. We had the lowest homicide statistics in post in, in, since the World War II. And yet in, in a two month period, you had Matthew Charles Lamb here in Windsor go on a shooting spree. Then in Chicago, you had Richard Speck who murdered eight nurses. And then a month after him, Charles Joseph Whitman ascended the Bell Tower at the University of Austin in Texas and shot 45 people. Um, and these today, that we wouldn't, you know, that would be in the news maybe for a couple, it would be two cycles of the news and it would be forgotten. But back then, these were revelations. These were not types of crimes people saw. It was just, we couldn't really wrap our heads around these types of killers because it was murder without motive. Like today, he would be convicted. There would be, he would never get away with an insanity offense. Without giving too much away, no spoilers, can you tell us a little bit uh, about why it was so important for you to explore what happened to this man? I wanted to tell this case from beginning to end because there was, so, there was a lot of misinformation here about people that, for the people that do remember what happened, nobody really understood what had happened afterwards. Everyone assumed, including the detectives from the Windsor Police Force, that Matthew Lamb would rot in Oak Ridge facility. He would be there basically for life because up until the late 60s, Oak Ridge facility had never released a murderer ever. 
And, but by the late 1960s, that had completely turned around with 